to everyone joining the 2020 Catholic Immigrant Integration Initiative Conference hosted by the Center of Migration Studies together with the University of Notre Dame. I'm very happy to moderate our student panel today. My name is Ilaria Schneider from Wartense. I'm the fourth research assistant professor at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies at the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. In the past years, I have been working in studying migration, and I had the privilege to meet and work with exceptional students here at the University of Notre Dame, as the one we will, that we'll present today. First of all, I'll give you a short presentation of our panelists. Cara Venzian is a second year Master of Global Affairs student concentrating in sustainable development with, with a specific focus on cultural sustainability. Cara is experienced in international development working in refugees issues, youth development and women's and LGBTQ plus empowerment. Sophia Pichukuk is also a second year Master of Global Affairs student. Prior to coming to Notre Dame, Sofia served as a volunteer missioner with Hearts Home in Senegal and in Italy, accompanying vulnerable and social isolated individuals living in lower income neighborhoods. Fiana is our third second year Master of Global Affairs, concentrating in sustainable development and minoring in peace studies. She identifies as a Bangladeshi Muslim American and is a developing transnational feminist. Finally, Elsa Barron is a senior at the University of Notre Dame studying biology and peace studies with a minor in sustainability. Over the years, Elsa did many research projects. For instance, in 2019, Elsa spent eight months in Jerusalem during which she volunteered at a community center in Ida Aida refugee camp. Now I'll present shortly um, the two projects that our students are presenting today. Our Master in Global Affairs students, Cara, Sofia, and Fiana, make up a team of graduate consultants that they were tasked by the Catholic Relief Service to research how refugees and internally displaced people define and create homes in both Uganda and Myanmar understanding what makes a shelter a home and a settlement a community provides a sustainable lens through which to promote self-recovery within disaster and conflict situations. Their findings indicate that home is much more complicated than some practitioners assume and is created in a multifaceted way encompassing not only physical aspects but also emotional, psychological and social aspects. Elsa Barron, our undergrad student, has conducted independent research on migrant integration and interreligious dialogue in Athens, Greece, with funding from the Nanovic Institute for European Studies and additional support from the Kellogg Institute for International Studies. She examined migrant integration through the lens of interreligious dialogue and religious acceptance. Using the case of study of Athens' first official mosque, she was able to broadly assess attitudes toward Muslim migrants. Despite ongoing opposition to the mosque project, she remains hopeful that this is a step toward greater dialogue and acceptance of Muslim uh, migrant communities. Now, I stop to speak and I give the floor to our students. Flora, um, Fiona, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ilaria. As Ilaria mentioned, there aren't enough funds available to solve this endemic problem of global displacement today. For the past nine months, we have been working with Catholic Relief Services in partnership with the Integration Lab at the University of Notre Dame to address this question. Is it possible to expand shelter solutions and reconceptualize refugee settlements centering dignity and sustainability? This question launched the CRS 2030 Homes and Communities platform. As a small but integral part of this new platform, our team has been tasked by Catholic Relief Services to research how refugees and internally displaced persons define and create home. We work specifically in Uganda and in Myanmar. Uganda hosts the most refugees in Africa. In fact, they host the fifth most in the world with over 1.4 million refugees residing. 
Uganda is well known for its progressive laws for refugees, including providing rights to own land, work, access to social services, move freely throughout the country, and promote equality between refugees and host communities. Refugees have been cycling through Uganda since 1959, with the largest population from South Sudan. They mostly currently reside in the Bidi Bidi settlement in Yumbe, the second largest settlement in the world. Our project centered on Bidi Bidi as one of the settlements in Uganda that we focused on. The second largest population of refugees comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they mostly reside in the Chengwali settlement in Eastern uh, Uganda. Uh, we also have the opportunity to work in Chengwali. Myanmar has a total of 498,000 IDPs, otherwise known as internally displaced people, as of December 2019. The IDP situation is largely caused by seven decades of armed conflict with ethnic minority insurgent groups that have existed since 1948, following the breakdown of the Panglong Agreement of 1947, alongside climate displacement. Despite a ceasefire that was signed in 2015, the conflict has been ongoing. However, the ceasefire and the government announcing the closing of the IDP camps in June of 2018 have led IDPs to increasingly attempt to move back home. Legal restrictions on the right to land ownership has made IDP camp living suffocating and IDPs desire to return to their livelihoods and attempt to take care of their land back home. Several resettlement opportunities have been offered by various NGOs, including CRS and other church groups locally. One of the pilot resettlement opportunities offered by CRS includes the pilot Three Mile community that we also had the opportunity to research. In this project, we had a goal of engaging 416 disaster affected displaced persons across Myanmar and Uganda. Displaced people experience a unique liminal state whereby entire peoples do not feel belonging in any space because they have been uprooted from their sense of normalcy and often contend with complex questions of belonging and identity. Research shows that definitions of home are directly linked to these identities. Thus, refugees and immigrants actually seek an end to what is for them a perpetually liminal status, reconceptualizing the way that they perceive home and community. Particularly, it's important for displaced people to conceive home in four thematic ways, the physical, psychological, social, and emotional, to reestablish a lost sense of grounding and reclaim their identity, building their capacity for self-recovery. Sophia will now discuss some of our findings related to the ways that our participants define and prioritize home in multifaceted ways. Thank you, Fiona. We gathered a large amount of data this summer from focus groups, interviews, photography exercises, and surveys. And the findings we'll share with you now come from qualitative analyses. As we read through our transcripts, we coded common themes within the categories of physical aspects of home with themes such as clothes and kitchen, social aspects, for example, visitors and gatherings, emotional aspects like peace and intercultural acceptance, and psychological aspects such as cleanliness and rituals. It was interesting that our respondents referred to all four categories in a balanced way as we conversed with them on the subject of home. This reinforces our point that home is conceived in multiple dimensions. However, when specifically asked to define home, half of the words that people used referred to the physical aspects of home, a quarter of the words to social aspects and even fewer to emotional and psychological aspects. So explicitly, people prioritize the physical aspects of home but in a more implicit way, all aspects are equally important. We can also learn a lot when we look at the top five ways that people in both countries define home. The first is family. Many respondents literally defined home as a father, mother, and children. So the presence of family members is essential if displaced people are to feel at home anywhere. The second is an emotional sense of safety and security an obvious priority for people fleeing conflict. This desire was captured best when people in Myanmar said that home needs to be warm, referring to the temperature and to the presence of safe and affectionate relationships. The third concept is animals. From this, we learned that people desire a source of income and even the status that comes with owning certain animals. But also in Kachun culture, one of the ethnic groups in Myanmar, a house cannot be considered a home until it has a main house, a chicken house, a pigsty, a cow shed, a kitchen, a patty storeroom, and a latrine. 
This links to the fourth top concept, latrines. We learned that people prioritize this because they want to keep their families healthy. Also, even displaced people do not want to be ashamed of their homes. And a latrine is a sign of a dignified home to welcome guests. The final concept was physical safety from harm, crime, and weather. Here we see that people do still want a home to be practical. For example, protecting one from rain and from thieves. I just described what people say in response to being asked to give a definition of home. When they are not directly asked, people spoke the most about cultivation. As displaced people from agrarian communities, cultivation as a source of food, income, and stability was on everybody's minds. Economic opportunities and money were also frequently referenced in conversation, which expressed a desire to provide for loved ones and to have access to cash to increase well-being. It is important to support displaced people in doing this. We found that men and women in both countries spoke about the importance of cultivation and family, but women gave preference to education for children and men to structural components of home. This shows that it's important to look into male and female perspectives when serving displaced communities. When looking at each country separately, we found that family and cultivation were still top priorities, but women and men in Uganda were preoccupied with having access to food and money. In Myanmar, women prioritized structural components of home and animals, whereas the men valued money and economic activities. From this, we see that though general themes remain the same, different cultural contexts dictate differing priorities. I will now turn things over to Kara to wrap up our presentation. Thank you, Sophia. In conclusion, home really is perceived beyond the walls. Our analysis has shown what scholars have already been predicting, which is that the per having a perception of home is a complex process and having an understanding of these multifaceted perceptions will prepare sector leaders for effective, efficient, dignified, and resilient programming. In our efforts with Catholic Relief Services, we will be providing insights and recommendations on how to scale this research in order to gather more voices and ultimately provide the most holistic programming that addresses the humanitarian funding gap that we mentioned at the beginning, emphasizing efficiency, self-recovery, and dignity for all peoples affected by disaster. These pictures that you see in front of you were taken by displaced people when prompted with us asking for them to show us through pictures important aspects of home. This first picture is a picture of food. Food is a physical aspect of home. Of food is essential to life. This picture is taken in Myanmar where food rations are given but are often not enough. And sometimes people will risk landmines, war, and even death returning to their villages to cultivate the land and to get food for themselves and for their families. Um, next picture, please. This second picture is a picture of a woman in Myanmar who's been placed in one of the very first resettlement sites where she will live for the rest of her life. The story behind this picture is that she looks out this window over onto the land that she's been given and she thinks about the wonders the lives of her children will hold in this new and interesting place. This speaks to the emotional aspect of home and having a desire for your children to have a good future. Next picture, please. This picture is of a man in Uganda making bricks in order to address a lack of economic opportunities and in order to provide for his family. He makes these bricks for his family to earn money, to buy food and other goods, and to have bricks to build his house and provide shelter for himself, his neighbors, and for his loved ones. Next picture, please. This is a picture of a lovely family in Uganda, comfortably outside of their shelter, which speaks to a social aspect of home, a deep-seated need for connection and family that Sophia has already mentioned. Next slide, please. To end our presentation, emphasizing that home really is more than just a shelter, we wanted to show this picture that represents a nuanced aspect of home, which can be summed up by this quote from the photographer, a parent in Uganda, who says, the importance of rearing heads at home is that when the child falls sick on the weekend and the hospital is closed, you can then sell the hen and buy medicine for the child, which helps to protect the child's life. These words show that the association between an animal, access, agency, healthcare, a child's life, and a home compound, it truly shows that the concept of home is deeply multifaceted. Thank you.
Thank you so much um, for, for your presentation. Now I give the floor to Emma, Elsa, sorry. Hello. So since 2006, the Muslim Association of Greece has been campaigning for the establishment of the first official mosque in Athens. While the government has agreed to its construction, the promised mosque remains stalled in its building operations. This inaugural mosque project has been very controversial in Greece and has been strongly opposed by alt-right groups such as Golden Dawn. Fear and frustration surrounding the presence of Muslims in Greece has only been heightened since the recent migrant crisis in Europe, coupled with an economic downturn in 2009, around the time this construction began. Additionally, historical memories of Ottoman occupation color the dialogue surrounding the integration of Muslims in Greece. Despite facing many challenges, the mosque project continues to have resilient advocates. In addition to providing a dignified place for Muslims in Greece to worship, an official mosque also eliminates the possibility of dubious foreign funding and influence at a time when the growth of extremist groups is a major concern in Europe. I contend that a public mosque in Athens could solve many challenges faced by Athens' Muslim community, provide Muslim migrants a place for their expression of dignity and identity, help to ensure greater security for the Greek state, and foster interfaith peace building through dialogue, integration, and education. In our discussion today, I'll focus mainly on the opportunity this mosque provides for dignity and interreligious dialogue. So this research pertains both to Greek Muslims and to Muslim migrants living in Greece. Um, but as the population of migrants continues to grow, um, they're often a, a larger focal point of the discourse regarding Islam in Greece. Um, and that is part of the reason why this mosque project has been so controversial. Um, one of the largest groups in active opposition to the project is Golden Dawn, which is a notoriously anti-immigrant party that was involved early on um, when the resolution for the construction of this mosque was passed. Um, and at some points, their opposi opposition has um, involved large demonstrations. For example, in 2016, they camped out on the construction site to prevent progress and had to be removed um, by the Greek military. And so that was a very extreme example of um, the strong opposition to this project. Um, however, it has a powerful motivation that's rooted um, in one of the arguments that was made in the parliament when, when this was up for debate, which was that historically Greeks have been deeply, have, have experienced restrictions of their rights and persecution. Consequently, um, the speaker argues that our historic identity fully understands the importance of religious tolerance. Um, and so this is one of the forces behind the mosque project is creating a open and welcoming society that um, does not further oppression of marginalized groups, but instead welcomes them and provides a space for them um, to practice their identity and their religion. So that leads to the importance of a mosque for Muslims and specifically Muslim migrants in Greece who are arriving often um, with few connections, with few financial resources. Um, and the opportunity to practice their religion in a mosque provides an important sense of dignity and of place. Um, so religion is a powerful tool that supports migrants along their journey um, and has been shown in various ways to help them cope with dislocation and trauma along their route. And so um, having this mosque is an important infrastructure that allows for that coping strategy. Um, but it also provides the opportunity for political identity and engagement um, with the government and with the Greek Orthodox Church, which is very much involved with the government. Um, and so one of the most important points is for the recognition of Islam in Greece. Currently in Athens, um, there are 100, over 120 unofficial mosque sites um, where largely migrant communities meet in basements in order to pray. Um, but as Anna Stamu points out from the Muslim Association of Greece, um, we want to be free and independent like you protect the Christians in the country. And then also um, there's a desire for greater security in this process of recognition. Um, and so Stamu also says we need a free voice, not somebody to depend on, like don't bring Saudi Arabia um, to build the mosque. 
And so there's this, this side issue of migrants coming in from other countries without many resources, wanting to have a place to practice their religion, but not having the resources to do so. And so um, foreign funding funders are stepping in, providing the funding for these locations, but often wanting to control the operation, which is harmful um, to the, the migrant community and also a red flag for the Greek state. And so um, the Muslim community in Athens wants to have their own control over the way religion is practiced. And um, that can be exemplified through the creation of the infrastructure of a mosque that provides leadership and a place to worship um, as a, a larger community. And then it also provides official representatives that can engage with dialogue with um, the Greek government and with the Orthodox Church. And all of this relates deeply to the integration of migrants into Greek society. Um, when I spoke with Angelos Valiantinos, who's a member of the Ministry of National Education and Religious Affairs in Athens, um, he pointed out that the guidelines for a mosque are for prayers to be conducted in Arabic, but the sermons to be given in Greek and English. And so I think this is an example of a larger hope for the mosque that it would bridge the gap between um, the places where migrants are coming from and the current community they are a part of in Athens. And language is often cited as an essential step in immigrant integration. And so having religious services in the Greek language makes this mosque a critical gateway into Greek society, a safe space um, where migrants can begin to pick up language, access language services, but uh, while doing so, or doing so in a community that is comfortable um, that is people who practice the same religion and, and have a shared identity and in a way um, that can hopefully inspire them to get more involved um, in the larger community of Athens. However, I think it's important to push beyond integration into dialogue across difference. And in this case, um, I'm talking about interreligious dialogue. And so the Inner Orthodox Society of Greece cites that one of the largest challenges to their dialogue with the Muslim community is the lack, the lack of official contacts um, or official representation, which is something that this mosque would provide. Um, but in, in contrast, the Muslim Association of Greece says that they are ready and willing to engage in more dialogue, in fact, have been seeking out opportunities for further dialogue, but have had to fight for it and haven't received the opportunities um, to actually interact on a high level with any other religious communities in Greece, um, largely because they are unrecognized. And so the mosque project is an important foundation for convening both the Muslim community together and building relationships that way, but also outreaching into other um, religious communities, bridging dialogue, and then also providing the potential for expanding religious education, which is something that is required for all um, Greek students and offers the opportunity to look to not only the Greek Orthodox Church, but also other religious communities to be involved um, in that religious education. So um, this project continues to face challenges. The most recent headline in regard to the mosque project is that the coronavirus delays Athens mosque opening. Um, and while the coronavirus has certainly delayed a lot of things across the world, this comes as no surprise to the Muslim Association of Greece, as there have been perpetual delays. Both times that I went to Greece to conduct interviews, um, there was a headline saying that the mosque would open within that month, and yet it has continued to experience delay after delay. Um, a project that has begun in 2006 and still remains to be concluded. But despite these challenges, um, I think that I and those at the Muslim Association have great hope for this project. A public mosque is a project that encourages cross-cultural dialogue and interreligious peace at a time of fear and exclusion across much of Europe. Um, and as the Muslim community of Athens welcomes the opening of the first mosque since the fall of the Ottoman Empire in their city, they alongside other Athenians can strategically think about the ways this institution can be used in Greek society to build an open and empathetic community, as well as an easier transition for those newly arriving on its shores. So thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you so much. And if you have one or two questions from 
um, from the audience, I can take it. Otherwise, I'm I'm gonna just ask myself a, a question to the our master students. So we 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 listen to Elsa and uh, and this religious dialogue that is happening in Greece. What about uh, in your project? And uh, did you see faith playing a role in the in the way that home is at the center uh, of their of their life? You mentioned money. You mentioned the um, uh, the need of uh, security. Uh, but what about faith? Thank you, Ilaria. That's um, a good question. We uh, we did code for and ask direct questions about the involvement of the church, but it, it was not a, uh, as common as you would have expected to be one of the p pillars of home. There were often scenarios, especially in Myanmar, where people were asking for um, altars or places of worship inside of their house, but uh, a lot of times people in Myanmar also lived on church compounds. And that's primarily where the uh, IDP compounds were, were under the supervision of a church. And so it wasn't so much that people were in their formation of home were looking for a church because they had already were in the presence of one. In Uganda, it was less common in the answers and people were more looking specifically for things like clan, uh, inter-clan peace and um, more across the across the board we're looking for other things like money and food and church was something that came up a few times but it wasn't as frequent as these other codes okay i would thank you so much cara i would love to continue this conversation unfortunately uh, we don't have time to continue i hope we we're gonna meet soon on campus and continue it uh, i thank you very much uh, our students for sharing their experiences and what they have learned during their studies. I invite you to stay here now uh, with us because we are now transitioning to the next plenary session and I give the floor to Donald Kirvin to, that is moderating next section. Thank you so much. <laughs>